by creating your content. It's not scary to be on camera. Uh, the camera doesn't bite. And then take that content, turn it into audio, turn it into text through the transcript, then add your, your transcript or your captioning back into the video. And you've created at least three bits of content there. Hi, and welcome to the Valor Circle podcast. Today, I'm going to welcome Jeremy and Ryan, both of my team with me today, to talk about search engine optimization. These chats, if you haven't seen them before, are very casual and are just intended to have us kibitz back and forth about what's happening in the industry, key things that you may want to know as a business owner or as a marketer about how to do search engine optimization in this case, and answer any questions that you may have shared with us prior to the call. So with that, Jeremy, Ryan, thanks for joining me today. Let's talk about search engine optimization. Uh, Jeremy is our digital marketing director. Where, where do we want to start with this? Um, that's a good question. I wonder if we should start with like new trends that are getting people to rank um, through like the tools that Google provides. Does that, does that sound be, like good? That'd be good. As I asked you, I actually thought of one too. And I know I get this a lot is do black hat tech tricks work and should businesses pay attention we don't have to start with that but i'd like to add that into the discussion at some point today to just kind of address those in other words is it worth trying to trick google so, um it, let, let's go and jump into that if you don't mind uh, no no I, i'd welcome your your opinions on that i've got mine but go ahead let's yeah. jump in uh the short answer is yes they work and uh no they don't meaning uh you will find really quick results and then oftentimes um, Google will then penalize you because they found out what happened. They're very, very smart. Um, so companies who sell like black hat techniques, um, it, it, it's going to be fully loaded in the front end. And then you're not going to be able to get your money back or you're not going to be able to see the reward uh, long term. And that's what search engine optimization really means. It's like that long term, uh, long tail keywords that you're always going for uh, with authentic data really and black hat seo is like just the opposite of uh, of that yeah oftentimes it makes me think of a, a phrase i heard from a mentor a few years back and that's that seo is a process it's not an event it's not something we simply flip a switch on a lot of black hat seo or those tricks are where you flip a switch but then we end up in a situation that as you mentioned where you know google will catch on plain and simple we know that's going to happen and then oftentimes especially this year I know we've just seen a tremendous number of what I would call Google slaps, where Google's then punishing and penalizing you for trying to trick them. Uh, just this morning, we talked about, you know, uh, a, a company out in New Jersey, or I'm sorry, New York in, in Long Island, that's having problems. Even be, They didn't try to do black hat, but Google thought they did. And now, essentially, they're blacklisted. Uh, and there's not much to do about that. Getting a hold of Google is probably harder than getting a hold of the IRS. Uh, it's yeah. not an easy thing to do. So, yeah. Ryan, what um, do you think? Um, I, I like Jeremy's answer. I think that, yes, you can see those results, but um, Google is like an elephant. They never forget. So just because you got away with it for a short period of time, um, you know, they don't, I was thinking, you know, the statute of limitations on, you know, things that Google doesn't uh, like, they could punish you at any time. So it's uh, definitely a significant risk and can not only affect you, affect those immediate results, but really punish you for, for a long time. So definitely would not recommend that. How do those factors, are there... I think we're all aware of the things you can do to your website for, you know, to... to game the system a little bit. Um, one of the things I, I think a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of is that there's on-site factors and off-site factors. Are there things that people should be aware of or, or um, con not concerned about, but just aware of uh, that they could potentially accidentally do or, or things that they should um, steer away from for some of those factors? That's a good question. Jeremy, you want to share without naming who it was that we were talking about this morning, but you know how they did something what they thought was okay, but actually following an email that Google sent to them uh, to add products to their website when they didn't have products and what Google's done to them? Uh, yeah. So um, they're a service industry and they don't offer a product that they can actually ship to your door. They actually have to show up. And so when they got this email, they went through and they 
took their services and added them as a product and then they got slapped in the wrist and then completely disabled because of it. So once we were able to take those down, uh, we were able to argue the case, uh, they did get back up. Um, and from what we're seeing, they got a slap on the wrist uh, and they're still being penalized, meaning that once Google thinks that you did something wrong on purpose, they're going to have a hard time rewarding you with rankings uh, after that. And so what we're doing is we're, which kind of leads, leads me to the next topic, is we're creating what they call authority or authorship um, that not only makes the owner of the business look like he's writing a, a bunch of articles or of a real, like a real person's writing it, not a bot or, um, you know, some, some canned uh, pages. We're, we're making him the author of everything on his website, along with uh, a link back to his Google business profile, kind of waving the flag at Google saying, Hey, we want to use your tools because we trust you. Would you trust me in return? And I think uh, that's kind of where the conversation should probably be at is, the authorship or the uh, authority that needs to be built by real people in order to start ranking because Google doesn't want that generic information anymore. Well, you know, let's talk a little bit of that. What are some of the things that people can do, business owners, marketers, that what are some of the just standard things they can do to, to follow Google's protocols, to work within Google guidelines that will help them with their search and their search engine rankings? Yeah. Um, follow the old and old but golden rules, right? If you have keywords you're going for, uh, write articles about them. Articles, blog posts, uh, news updates, whatever you want to call them. Um, those are those are searched by Google because they're always looking for that updated information that's the most current and relevant to what somebody's searching for. So if you write articles and you have the correct standards that Google wants, right? We have a keyword in there X many times. We have over 500 words uh, is what we're, our goal is, between five and 600 words. Um, if you have images on, on the blog, make sure they're named properly, make sure they're sized properly. So when they're fed uh, to uh, the public that they can pull them up on their phone super quickly, as an example. Uh, you wanna have a link out, but one or two links out uh, to uh, create that relevancy or um, the authority that says like, I'm so confident in my my article here that I'm actually gonna link to other resources that you can actually go and, and double check my work. That tells Google that you're not trying to be a hog and, 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 and make the data all come to you. And you have an internal link to another page on your website, like a, a contact page, for instance. So Google knows that you're, you're, you're trying to create that link inside the website as well. So it's a big recipe. Um, and that's why I think hiring professionals is probably the, the best thing to do. Uh, and it does pay off in the long run. You know, once you once you rank, you're going to be ranking for some time until somebody goes at that same keyword and writes a different article. But that's why when you blog, it just always updates on a constant basis. And that's what Google wants. They want updated, relevant information all the time. It, it makes me think of, uh, you know, oftentimes clients will say, does, does blogging really matter? Does adding that new content matter? And we know it does. And we've seen that consistently. But just in a real world case study that I'll, I'll share, about six years ago, we as Valor Circle went out and, and created some location landing pages. Uh, many of you may know we're located in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And we wanted to, at the time, we were really focused on attracting businesses in and around West Michigan. So we grabbed some of the cities and we created landing pages. And one of those was Holland, Michigan. And we found out, for example, and my numbers may be slightly off, but People, about 120 people a month were searching for Holland web design, referring to Holland, Michigan. So we went out and we created a landing page that was optimized for that phrase, Holland web design. Again, that was nearly six years ago, maybe slightly longer. I'd have to go back and check. And since then, I don't believe we've done anything on that page. Um, that page is optimized well, and I'll say that, but let's just say five years. I know that's a five years later. I just checked it this morning actually with a client and we're still ranked number three in Google five years later off of one location-based landing page that we did. Um, now, some of the others didn't do that well, and I'm not going to say everyone's going to work that well, but I think that demonstrates the power of a well-optimized location and services page combined. When we take a location and we take a service and we combine those together, Holland and web design, 
We put that together. You do a good job at it. Those pages can have tremendous payback for you uh, uh-huh. because we know that 60% of the people that are calling out of those hundred or so leads are going to call the top three people. And so just roughly that puts us in line to receive, let's say only 10% of those people actually made a phone call or an inquiry. Uh, that means that's you know, six leads a month that we could be receiving off of one landing page that we created over five years ago. Uh, and I yeah. think it's just an example of a case study. Uh, you're welcome to go out and create your own and it'll probably beat us now because I'm sharing that, that little secret in that one town. But Jeremy, that makes me think, of again, that benefit. And we talked about that in our recent book that, that we just put out um, about the benefit of, again, combining location and service together as a keyword on either a blog or a page or anything like that. I know one of the questions that people often ask, is there a difference between writing a blog post and creating a page on their website or from Google's perspective, are those the same things? Well, that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, Pages are supposed to be static. I don't want to, to make stat- it easy. Come on. <laughs> no, no, I, no. Pages, pages are meant to be static information that are linked internally or externally all the time. A blog, um, we have other features that work for us when we actually post blogs, and that's going to be how they're categorized on your website and also how they're tagged when they're put up um, on, into the public. Uh, a category helps Google know that you're going for the right data, right? I mean, the, the, the bots that come on websites are super smart. A tag is just a clickable link that if, if they wanted to find a relevant information and click on a tag and then anything inside that website that, that fits that tag is, is going to be easily searchable. I think there's a benefit to blogging um, that would probably help, uh, I'm going to say like internally, more than externally just the way that it's organized um but th- there's no there's no wrong th- i don't know if there's a right answer to this jonathan <laughs> well no it's fair it's and, and i guess my answer to people has always been not I'm, I'm a bit less technical and probably less well not probably definitely less knowledgeable than you are in this but i've always said worry less about whether it's a blog or a page and worry more about creating the content because at the yeah. end of the day i think creating the content beats it's that old 80, 20 rule that gets us 80% of the way there because we've created it. it yeah. Is that a fair assessment on my part or am I missing something? No, I, th- I think it's more than fair. I, I think the one thing that blogs might have going for them, and this is why we, we ask to blog regularly is that when we post, we can actually do what they call a ping back. And also um, we can mm-hmm. spend those blogs to an RSS feed. And when we do those items, there's a little more traction that can happen. Um, but you have to treat a blog like a blog and a page like a page. It's different information that's going to go on each. So it is the content that, you, that you're talking about, 100%. It's their intent. And that's what Google actually is, is ranking for right now is the intent. Mm-hmm. That makes me think of another question. I know I get asked a lot in the sales process is, you know, that's great. I need a blog. Does that blog need to be part of my website or can I go out to wordpress.com or another service like medium or something like that and put my blog there and will that still help my website rank i know the answer to that do you want to share your thoughts on that i do um if your blog is relevant to your website it's okay to have an external blog that links into your website um self-hosted blogs will probably perform better uh, but having that inter- that external link going into your website also creates authority. It's, it's two sides of the same coin. And there's no right or wrong answer. Um, I'm not sure. What, what What's your opinion on that, though, Jonathan? I'm kind of curious. Well, I'm, I'm, my opinion may be wrong. It's my opinion. But I, I definitely think you're better to have it as part of your website, either even if it's a separate tool that you're using. Maybe you, you've got a website built in Joomla and you want to build your, your blog in WordPress or vice versa. I think it's better if it's part of the same domain structure because I think that adds more total credibility to the domain. Um, part of that, I, I, I get where you're going with the linking and I, I don't disagree with you, but 
I don't think that people use links enough. And so my concern would be that you're going to lose value um, by going to, let's just say, WordPress.com. And for those of you who don't know, WordPress.com is what they call a, a, a hosted solution that you're paying, and WordPress has it there. So your domain is likely to be something like ValorCircle.WordPress.com as opposed to ValorCircle.com. And while it seems the same, those are two totally different websites to Google. And while I'd love to be challenged, and if anybody's watching this that wants to disagree or that knows more, let me know. It just seems to me, in my experience, that you're better off in most cases to make that blog part of your primary domain, or in our case, ValorCircle.com, as opposed to a different domain. Uh, because I don't think people understand linking well enough and do it consistently enough to get to make up for the loss of having a separate domain. I, I, I definitely can see where you're coming from. Yeah. Absolutely. But, I would you know, the, the, the interesting thing is it, it points out, sorry, Ryan, um, it sure. points out the difference in, you know, you can have different opinions on some of this because some of it is art, some of it is skill, but some of it's art. Go ahead, Ryan. I was just say, especially for those people we're trying to give actionable advice to, um, to your point, Jonathan, the linking structure and trying to manage two platforms if you have an external blog uh, is likely just to add more work and more complexity to the, the situation as opposed to keeping it all together. Um, <clears throat> and to linking out, I, I um, one of the things uh, you mentioned, Jeremy, was having those links that come into the website and uh, in general content is king. And the aspect of actually utilizing and recycling those blogs and posting links to that blog on your social media, on your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your Google uh, business profile and link using those, um, using that one blog post, that one piece of content and turning it into uh, a handful or even more um, by getting that uh, disseminated throughout other platforms as well. Yep. What are I some other things that, that you guys can recommend. So we obviously we believe in writing content, creating new content. Um, one of the things I know a lot of people talk about online is backlinks and the importance of any backlink uh, coming into the site. Um, there's a lot of things we could talk about with backlinks, but uh, Jeremy is you know senior director of marketing. Can you kind of start this off and talk about what backlink is and, and what backlinks have value and maybe which ones don't, if, if any don't? Yeah. Um, Going to kind of backtrack, uh, you have to think of SEO as kind of like a, a pyramid where we hope that our website is going to be on top of that pyramid. And in order to get that to the top of the pyramid, we have to create what they call the authority. And so we have external links linking into your website. That's called a backlink. And um, there's definitely a difference on the weight of the link, uh, meaning like the, the heavier the link, the more you're, the, the heavier of the link, the more you're going to rank. Um, you know, if you take a, a high profile domain like facebook.com link into your site, Google will reward you for that. But if I go to, um, a, you know, just some random blog like monkeys with bananas in their hands.com and link into my site, it's probably not going to have as much weight as, as Facebook because one, it's, it's probably not relevant, but two, not very many people are going to like, go to that website. Now that website can be purchased and it's going to become one of the biggest websites. And I, I, I say awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was like, maybe Except, don't, don't search for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. Um, but I, the, the weight of uh, the domain definitely carries authority, but it's also the, the content of the, the where it's coming from, right? So mm -hmm. for instance, if, you, yeah. if you're on a health blog and you have a health food store link into your, your blog, that's showing Google that you are an authority that health food stores are looking at and they will reward you by ranking. If you own a health food store and a shoe company links into your website, um, it might, if it's talking about the right diet for running, right? So Google is super smart. And if you want to start creating those backlinks, what you really want to start doing is writing articles and submitting them to be linked into your website uh, through sites that you know, maybe even that you search all the time uh, for data anyway. Yeah, I think the, the key takeaway for me in that is relevant website to your business. In other words, um, I don't need a chocolate chip cookie company linking into my um, health website unless for some reason we have a partnership 
for healthy chocolate chip cookies, uh, or maybe mm-hmm. even a more applicable. I don't necessarily need a, a, a real estate agent who's selling homes linking in because there's not necessarily a direct correlation between buying a home and my health food store, especially if I've got a realtor in Grand Rapids linking to me and I'm a health food store in Los Angeles. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Good. Is there a difference between the authority you get from, uh, for my example, you know, linking or, or linking back to your blog post from your Facebook profile versus having, um, you know, a, a, a similar site or a relevant site link to your website instead? Uh, if there was, if somebody was going to have to prioritize one or one or the other of those, Jeremy, is there one that would influence or impact them more? Yes. Um, this is a loaded question too, because it depends on how many followers or how big your audience is on Facebook compared to how many people age or look at that as a reference on a daily basis. Most people, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this from my experience, most people probably have like 2000 people or under, and we know that Google algorithm only serves uh, maybe 5% of those people, your, your feed on a regular basis. So if somebody were to post on Facebook, it's not going to have as much pull you know, maybe you're looking at like 50 people who look at that link in, on, a, on any given day versus a website that would call that call your link on a regular basis that has a lot of authority that points into your website. If you're asking the question, Ryan, I would say try to write articles for influential websites to get them on their blog with a link into your website. That's where I would probably spend most of my time. I like that. Are, th- are there any tips, Jeremy, uh, that we can give to people on certain sites that they can place content on to link mm-hmm. back to their site that may provide some value? Um, one yeah. that I think of, I know we had a conversation recently about a site called SoundCloud. Um, can you explain how that might add value? I'm not guaranteeing it, obviously, and why yeah. that link might have value from Google's perspective. Yep, 100%. Um, it's, it's the authority that's coming in and also how you categorize it. So right off the bat, some free tools that you can use, you know, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all that fun stuff. Link trees, uh, YouTube and SoundCloud are awesome because it's using media that we can emphasize that media with a link into the blog. And so um, one of the things that we do, is we actually can read out a blog, record it as an audio or a video file, upload it to YouTube and SoundCloud with a link into the original article. And that does create um, an external link for authority from these really high domain, uh, high ranking domain um, authorities, websites, I guess I want to say, um, on a consistent basis. And those have, I mean, you know, you get subscribers right away on YouTube or, or SoundCloud just by trying. And I think that's really important. Now, when we talk about that, though, just to be clear, and, and correct me if I'm mistaken, but in back- Adding an audio file from SoundCloud or a video from YouTube on your website doesn't create an inbound link. It's actually sending somebody maybe from the description or something like that from them back to your website, correct? Or am I getting that incorrect? You're correct. It's not an inbound link, but it does create authority based on where the video comes from on YouTube and the website that it's placed on. It's... So even different. even embedding a, a video can have value to my website then? Uh, yeah. Uh, like if you use YouTube, for instance, uh, it's a Google mm-hmm. tool, Google on YouTube. If you use their tools on your website, they will reward you. Okay, cool. Cool. I appreciate awesome. the clarification. Would it make sense? Uh, one of the things I want to touch on, because what you said, Jeremy, is taking those blog posts and turning them into an audio file and turning them into a video. Um, the other way around, though, if somebody has a video, turning that into the, the um, dialogue from that video, turning that into a transcript, uh, which we can then create into a blog post and, and um, do the same exact thing in reverse. Um, can you, eh, what's the best way, <laughs> but can you talk a little bit about like um, so maybe some tools people could use to take a video on their phone and utilize that as a blog as well? Uh, yeah, um, Jonathan has a really good tool that, that he uh, recommends all the time uh, called Descript. And Descript allows Love us it. to tra- transcribe a uh, video uh, into a text file. Um, you just have to understand like um, different bots would crawl videos or different bots can crawl audio. 
uh, when they can crawl text, it's really easy because it's just like literally it's right in front of them and they can read it super, super quick. So having that transcript of the video is definitely one of the easiest ways to blog, in my opinion. You literally can post the, the YouTube video on your website and have transcript and then have some links out in that transcript if you, if you mention a resource. Easy peasy, easy peasy. For example, they could see the link in this description to get a link to uh, that Descript and yep. uh, more information on it. So, yeah, there we go. <laughs> well, and that's a good point from a workflow perspective. You know, if, if I'm a huge fan of video. Most people know that if they pay any attention to the stuff I post. And if we create video and then we take that video and we bring it into a tool like Descript, and it is definitely one of my favorites for the cost that artificial intelligence in Descript is going to go ahead and transcribe that. And there's a bunch of value that I can get at. First, I have my video, so I've created one piece of content. Descript can extract the audio file out of that, and now I have two pieces of content. Then they can extract the transcript out of it, and I'm going to, don't have three hands, but I've got three pieces of content. Beyond that, then I can even go back in and add in Descript, I can add that transcript back on top of my video. And that's something I know a lot of people don't think about, but it can be really crucial for engagement. And obviously, the better engagement you have, the more value that has in search as well. Because I read a study just the other day that nearly 80% of people that watch video on their phones watch it with the volume turned off. And so having that, that transcript, that captioning put on that video uh, can really increase engagement because people will skip over videos that don't have that. Uh, and it's super easy to do using a tool like Descript. There are certainly others. If you've got a favorite, that's fine. But from a workflow perspective, I highly recommend start, start by creating your content. It's not scary to be on camera. Uh, the camera doesn't bite. And then take that content, turn it into audio, turn it into text through the transcript, then add your, your transcript or your captioning back into the video. And you've created at least three bits of content there. The next cool thing, though, is that you can take that content and distribute it across different platforms. So that audio file, not only can I make available on my website and can I upload to SoundCloud, but I can also send that out as a podcast so that it's on tools like Spotify and Google Podcasts and Apple Podcasts and others. And the neat thing, and Jeremy, correct me if I'm going too far here, but each one of those can create links again back to your website for every episode and the title of that episode then is going to be very clear to Google as to what that topic is. And it allows you to create just tremendous amounts of topic related and keyword specific content that all ultimately links back into your website. Am I correct in that? You're 100% correct. And I think it just goes to emphasize the importance of authorship and authority. Every time that you mm -hmm. do something like that, Jonathan, you're creating a piece of authority on different outlets and the, the Google gods will reward you accordingly. You just will. You, you talk about authorship, and can you explain a little bit about what that means on a website? How do I set authorship, and why is that important from Google's perspective? For example, why does Google care whether that piece of content came from me or you or Valorous Circle or our support team? Uh, exactly. So um, authorship is a profile that we create on the back end of a website. Uh, there's also a tool called Gravatar. If you create a, uh, a profile on Gravatar with links to the appropriate outlets. And what we found is if you create a Gravatar and your website domain, in this instance, uh, for the people that we serve, it's actually a link to your Google business profile. What happens is anytime that that person writes an article, Google, not a business. I, I need to stress that it's a person because Google actually wants people to be writing this information or creating the content. So I'm going to stress that it's authorship, not corporate ship. It's, it's somebody writing. Every time they write a piece of article or create a page that uses that gravatar or that that um, that account, it's attached to the, the metadata of a website, meaning like we can actually display the author. And that is actually something that Google looks at, make sure it's a relevant person. And then it builds upon uh, the person's relevancy on that topic at hand. Um, and so, for instance, if somebody Googles that person and they write a lot of articles, they'll find every single article that, that person has written in the past. And um, authorship is, is probably the next phase, in my opinion, of SEO. And Google's going to be probably very, very stringent on making sure that um, these AI bots 
that write amazing text aren't writing everything for the internet and making it irrelevant. They want somebody real writing the information and, and making it as best of resources as possible to the people doing a search. So if I take that to the next step, that means that I, as a founder, you as an executive, Ryan as an executive, um, we should be creating, in addition to creating content that may go on our corporate website, we should have personal profiles, professional profiles, a professional Facebook page, maybe a professional Twitter account, um, things like that, that help, that are tied together Again, using the same name, using the same key information so that Google can create not only a company profile, but an author profile for us that adds more credibility. Because as you said, Google wants people writing, not entities writing. Is that correct assumption? Correct. Yep. They want they want some evidence that there's somebody writing that in the background, not just the machine. It's easy to pump out data. It's really, it's really important to make sure that... Um, it, it, it's authentic too. Authentic and authority, in my opinion, probably go hand in hand. I think that's a. I think that's a great point. I. I maybe it's because of the industry we're in, but I see so many AI. Uh, you know, this use this AI to write your blog uh, advertisements now, and it's very enticing. It's very um, appealing to like, yeah, perfect. Give me ten blog posts, and I don't have to write them. Um, but I think this is a great point to bring up because that can actually end up uh, uh, hurting you in the future um, if it's if Google kind of starts inspecting those things differently. Uh, as we talk about some of those uh, Google tools, do you think it'd be good to touch on a little bit more about the Google business profile and, and the impact that that can have to um, your SEO and, and helping your site rank? Um, yeah. Great. Um, Jeremy? Yeah. Uh, one Brian, yes, absolutely, it's important. And that's why we actually, um, the, the previous video that we shot actually talks about it. Um, oh. <laughs> and um, for service for services, I think it's it's vital to make sure that you're using the tools correctly. Obviously, we talked about what could happen if you don't use them correctly. Um, not only use them correctly, uh, but actually use them. Uh, a lot of service businesses have a Google business profile and they wonder where they're not ranking because they're not going in there and, and using the tools that Google provides for you on a regular basis. And the map pack is what, where people want to be. And so if you use your Google, Google, if you use your Google business profile, all the way it's meant to be, uh, and you link to it and you post on it and you keep it updated on a regular basis, it'll def definitely help with your rankings uh, and uh, authority when it comes to uh, writing and, dis and distributing content across the internet. So they should check out the last video for more details about how to, yep. <laughs> to be successful in that. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> don't worry, Ryan. I don't remember what we talked about the last video either. So you're good. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a few weeks actually for us with uh, things going on. So I think it's been probably over a month since we recorded that. Um, yeah. What are some other ideas and let's kind of maybe wrap up on this. Or what are some ways, I know I always get the question of what do I talk about? What do I share? Can you guys each share just a, a handful of tips or questions people can ask to come up with the type of content that they should be creating that their prospects and customers might be interested in? Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, the one thing that when I'm talking to, you know, prospects or uh, clients about, you know, what's that, what is the, the one thing to start with? I always say either case studies about, customers you've helped or start answering your frequently asked questions uh, in more long form on your blog. Those are things that you already know. You are expert at what you do. And to just say, these are, here's 10 questions I get on a regular basis and make a blog about each of those. I think that um, is a lot, is an easy place to start for a lot of people. Um, I'm, I'm going to build on that. Exactly what Ryan said. Uh, I'm a spreadsheet guy, so I think it might be ideal to go through the topics that you know a lot about. Um, and then in this case, it'd probably be about your business. Um, I'm going to use an example to hopefully help solidify what I'm trying to say. If I own a salon, um, I probably have uh, three hair products that I always recommend, right? A shampoo, a conditioner, and uh, a, a, a body thing. Well, those are three three topics right there. And then I could have 
uh, tips and tricks for each one of those. And they could have a story about each one of those and how it might have affected one of my client's life. Um, and then I could go on saying, here's a competitor that maybe costs twice as much, but does the same thing that you should be watching out for, for each one of those items. And so um, out of those three things that I know really well about, I've already created in, what, 12 blogs, um, which is almost a year's worth of, of content. But if you have a spreadsheet, you could pretty much say tips and tricks, uh, story, um, competitors, and then um, uh, other resources or something like that for any topic and they come up with topics. And those are four different blogs you can write about each time you bring up a topic. I'm a spreadsheet guy. What can I say? No, I, I appreciate it. That's, that's great insight, guys. I, I appreciate it. And last thing I think to, to end on is frequency. And I'll, I'll address this one and let you guys agree or disagree. But um, I know everybody, you know, more is better, plain and simple. But if you're just getting started in this, you wonder how many blog posts do I need to create? How many new articles do I need to create? Um, we have found through some of the associations we're part of and the coaching groups that the minimum, and I mean minimum, bare minimum you should do is one a month. But one a month done consistently 12 times a year, like Jeremy was just referring to, will add so much value as opposed to doing none or to doing 12 today and not doing any of the rest of the year. So one, one per month, even if you record them all over the holiday break, put out one a month. Uh, and I think you'll be really pleased with the, the help that that'll provide in SEO. That's, that's it for me. Jeremy, Ryan, anything you want to add to that before we call it a day? The one question I get asked all the time is how much do I write? Um, write 300 words or more. I, it's, it's a paragraph and a half when it, when it all comes down to it. So, um, it doesn't have to be a lot of content, not at all. But long content's good too, correct? I mean, if somebody wants better. to go on for 10 minutes, that's that's Google loves some of that as well. It's better. But if somebody's just getting started, um, you know, a thousand words could be good intimidating. Point. So. Yeah, good point. I forget. Not everybody likes to talk journey. like me. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, anything cool. you want to add to that? No, I, um, the only thing I, I know Jeremy had mentioned kind of some um, minimum word counts before, but I think that is a, a, a great, a great piece of advice is it doesn't have to be long. It can be literally, like you said, Jeremy, a paragraph and a half. And uh, yeah, yeah, about something we're all an expert on. It's doable. <laughs> I was going to say, as as a, uh, one of the guys I like really well, uh, Sean Cannell from, or actually Cannell, I'm sorry, from uh, Think Media says all the time, just press record. If you don't want to record, start typing, but just do it. And I think you guys will be amazed at the difference you'll f see a year from now if you just get out there and try. It's really amazing. Um, I'll tell you what, guys, what we can do is we can actually create a, a spreadsheet that you can download. Um, and we'll have it up at the valorscircle.com slash link tree. Uh, they can do a free download. Uh, if you're looking to how to build a blog and, and make content, it'll be a free resource you can, a free resource you can download uh, very easily. Mm -hmm.